Wasn't expecting to preach tonight. Pastor sent me a message a couple days ago, and uh, it was a blessing to get the opportunity to preach to you guys tonight. Uh, just so you guys know, we are going back to our home church where I got saved. Uh, the pastor there has been there for 50 years. He planted that church. He's 80 years old. He's starting to have some health issues. He's also uh, just had some uh, surgery on his eye. And uh, so we're going back there. And this all started about mid-September. I got a phone call asking if there was any chance, a possibility, possibility I'd go back to Wisconsin. We we're right in full-fledged uh, family campaign mode and, and just trying to pray and focus on that. And then things just kept progressing, and there was some more issues there that they desperately needed help. And then my work on October 18th said, they will not have your position anymore after November. So it kind of made a door wide open. Uh, when I think about Richland Center, Wisconsin, when I think about where I come from, I think about the blessing that God saves souls. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, never saw a church, never read a Bible. My parents moved to rural Wisconsin. I always wonder, if it wasn't for us moving to rural Wisconsin, would I ever hear the gospel? Flip on over to Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, I'm kind of changing my message up. Sarah loves that I have like ADHD. I change things all, all the time. She's like, give me the ink pen. Give me whatever you got. We, we just need to slow down. But I want to go, I want to focus our, uh, my message on burden for the broken. Can I tell you something? I didn't realize before I got saved that I was broken. I was broken. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, it says this. These six things the Lord does hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deceives wicked images, feet that are swift to run to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Can I tell you something? I never knew God hated anything. I didn't know God. I didn't realize that I, I wasn't saved. When I sat there, every time I go into Richland Baptist Temple, I passed where I sat that day, and I heard God's word for the first time say I was wrong. I'm thankful that God broke the pride that was in my heart, Amen. broke me down, but can I tell you something? After I got saved and he broke me, he also gave me a burden. He gave me a burden for other people that were lost. We're going to spend a lot of time in, in, Luke chapter, uh, in Luke chapter 16. And a lot of you guys know this is the rich man and the poor man. Rich man and Lazarus. Can I tell you something? There's, there's something in here I want to give you guys. And it, it has to do with the burden for souls. Before I was saved, church didn't really matter. The Bible didn't matter. When I got saved, I realized that I just won the greatest lottery that there was. I had a home in heaven. I also know that there's a ton of people in my family tree, in Sarah's family tree, that I work with, that I went to school with, that are not saved. They haven't heard the gospel. They might be living it up, having the means that seem great at the time, but just like this rich man, they're going to see that it isn't what they want. So, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, and here we go. <clears throat> 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores, and desiring to feed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and looked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Right away we see two different things. We see a man carried off into the bosom. We see a man that's buried. We go on to the next verse. The next verse, we see this. We see, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes. In hell. Hey, there is a hell. This world wants to say everybody's going to heaven. Every time I see somebody pass away on, on Facebook, you know, rest in peace, well, I'll see you in heaven. Not everybody that I see on Facebook is going to heaven. Not everybody I see in Richland Center of Wisconsin is going to heaven. 
They need to hear the gospel. We go on here, it says he woke up in hell. He raised up his eyes in hell, being tormented, and seeing Abraham afar off in Lazarus' bosom. Can I tell you something? He knew who Abraham was. This man was a religious man. Can I tell you something that Wisconsin has a ton of? A ton of religious people. There are Lutheran churches and Catholic churches all over the place. We're going to a town of 5,000. There's a couple towns that have only about two to 300 people, but they'll have a Catholic church and a Lutheran church, and they will have no conviction. Can I tell you something? I'm so thankful that there was a preacher in southwest Wisconsin that preached the gospel and preached with conviction. It was conviction that made me realize that I was going to a sinner's hell. Can I tell you something? I don't want anybody, anybody to go to a sinner's hell. I, I, I sit here and I say this to you, and I don't make light of it. I, I enjoy soul winning, not because it, it's fun going out and meeting new people. It's because when somebody does come to church, and, and it doesn't have to be because they got saved at the door. We just had a lady that got baptized this morning, came off the bus route. You've been picking them up all the time. That, that's exciting to me. That's exciting to me, seeing people get saved. That's something special. You know, I spent many, many years fishing, going up trout streams, catching big trout and catching northern pike. And, man, it was fun, but it, it doesn't top seeing somebody get saved. It doesn't top a little kid getting saved at, at the family revivals. And, and you, you, when you get contagious, it gets contagious seeing people get saved and have a burden that you, you just can't help if you love people than the want to see them get saved. Because you know the outcome. The outcome is that they have a home in heaven. So Lazarus, Lazarus was the poor man. Lazarus was the man that really had the less desirable life. Can I tell you what's great about the gospel? What's great about the gospel? The rich man seemed to have it all, but he had nothing. The gospel's free to anybody, rich or poor. You know what? Sometimes we don't realize how valuable the gospel is because we get too busy in our day-to-day -day lives. I put down here, we are all equal when it comes to sin. Romans 3.23 says, as it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one. Look, the rich man could not change his eternal outcome by his financial situation. Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat, whether you're rich or poor. The difference is people that had a burden to share the gospel. You go down a little bit more from there, and I, I wrote down this. I wrote down, God knows who is his. God knows who is his. You know, before I got saved, before January or June uh, 2003, I, I might have thought I was a good person. I might have thought something, you know, something after this life was there for me. But until I realized that I was a sinner, there was no home for me. But God takes note. God takes note. Revelation 20.15 says this, and whosoever was not writ, uh, wasn't found written in the book of life was cast into the fire. That means God takes record. God knows. God takes record. You know what? When uh, June 2003 ha came and I got my heart convicted and I came to the altar and I didn't know what I was doing and somebody led me down the Romans road, my name became in the book of life. I was jotted down. I'm on his side. I'm his. No faking. No, there, there, there's nothing that you can fake to get past God. You know, my kids sometimes will fake like they did their homework. They'll fake like they would clean their room. And, and, and they might be able to fool me for a day. You know, it, it doesn't really help when you go and the teacher gives you a little slip. Jeremiah did not do this assignment. You know, eventually it comes out. You know, you can fake Christianity all your life. But at the end, it's going to be found out. I wrote down here. I got down here. I said... There, are, there will be church-going people that will fake it on this earth, but will not be able to fake God. They will not be found in the book of life. So why was the rich man not found written in the book of life? He at no point saw himself as a sinner that needed to be saved. He was never broken over his sin. Can I tell you something? When I realized what, that I sinned and I realized what Jesus went through, what Jesus went through for our sin. We sometimes just, he died on the cross. We, we say it so flippantly, he died on the cross. Jesus did a whole lot more than die on the cross. 
He was beaten for us. He was spat on. They pulled his beard out. They whipped him. He carried that cross and he took our sins. He, he put up with a lot, a lot more than just a flippin', flippantly saying he died on the cross. He took, he took our sins and he bore them and he bore them in a hard, humiliating way. Can I tell you something? There's nothing that I can do other than submit to him and try to win as many souls as I can to ever repay him. And I still won't do enough. I, I, I look back at the scriptures some more, and, and, and I start thinking, and I put down this. It doesn't matter the amount of resources you all, uh, you all have or God, uh, you know, that we have or the rich man has. Unless God breaks us, we must come to a point where we realize our sin had a cost. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, that gift had a price. That gift had a price. It was Jesus on the cross. You know, that price, whenever we buy anything, whenever we, we consume anything, we, we tend to want to use it. You know, if you, if you were bought by Jesus, if, you, if he died for your sins, he, he intends on using you. Uh, one of the things I know for sure he wants us to do is share the gospel. You know, when I think about going back home to Richland Center, Wisconsin, I've been thinking about this since junior year of college. Sarah has seen the notebooks. I have down names written down. Joe Chadwick needs to hear the gospel. Joe Chadwick was a buddy of mine that we went out fishing all the time. Kyle Bindle, a man in, in Schreiber Foods, works in the dairy, young guy, needs to hear the gospel. Don Mick, former brother-in-law, needs to hear the gospel. My sister Amanda needs to hear the gospel. My other sister needs to hear the gospel. There are people that I feel there's only, the only way they're going to be reached is if I go back. Because I don't see anybody else getting after it. Can I tell you something? I, I like to joke around. I like to have fun. My parents gave me two sisters and a border collie. I thank God I took after the border collie because all I knew how to do was get after it. And I plan on getting to Wisconsin, getting after it, knocking on doors, trying to get people in the church. But can I tell you something more important than anything? I'm going to start praying, praying that God, God gets to these people. So I started, I started reading, I stopped at 24, and I said this, it says this. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, and he may dip the tip of his finger into the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou... Though in thy, thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, there can... They pass us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. This is the big one, big kicker right here. For I have five brothers. You know what? He's being tormented, but he's realizing who he should have been reaching. Can I tell you something? There's going to be people that I know, even though I'm going to heaven, there's people that I should have shared the gospel with. You know what? There's going to be people that are being tormented in hell that are going to realize, hey, this, this Bible, this Bible is real. This Jesus is real. This word is real. I don't want my mom to go there. I don't want my sister to go there. I don't want my neighbor to go there. Too late. They got the burden, but it's too late. We need to have the burden while we have time. We need to have the burden while we have time. Can I tell you something else? God, God loved us so much that he commanded his love towards us while we were yet sinners. Romans 5, 8. But God commanded his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He already had a plan. He knew you were going to mess up. He knew that you are going to have problems, but he loved you anyway. We should love the unlovable. You know... It's a sad state when you go into a church and 
There is no rough looking people. I'm not trying to be mean, but we're supposed to reach everybody. We need to reach the ones that are not so very easy. Can I tell you something else? When I go back to Richland Center, Wisconsin, we preached, I preached there a while back, and there was a little old lady named Frankie. She wouldn't say she's old, but I say she's old because I've always known her as Frankie. And Frankie goes up to me after I got done preaching, and she shook my hand. She goes, you know what's funny? She goes, I remember you being a, a wild young kid that just needed direction. And she goes, I also remember you punched out the song leader in the parking lot. And she goes, I can't believe you're the one preaching. Can I tell you something? God uses messed up people if they'll just submit. Second chances, third chances, we need to give people chances. I'm thankful for a Lord of second, third, and fourth chances. Because thank goodness, I, thank God I need it. So, brokenness. God sees and knows us and knows our sins. We just need to be broken enough to know that we need a Savior. Romans 10, 13 says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not that hard. Realize that you're a sinner. Realize that you need to be saved. Call on him. Call on him. Can I tell you something? When I got saved, there's a couple things that happened right after I got saved. Started hanging out with people that read the Bible. Started spending time with people that were much older and some that were around my age, but mainly most, way older people that were more wise. I remember Mr. Maloney every single Saturday. Jameson, what are you doing? I don't know. You're cutting wood. I don't know who likes to cut wood, but Brother Ralph Maloney, retired man, every time would quote something out of the Bible, and he'd just give me Bible truths while we're doing work. And, and, and I didn't realize he was discipling me in that time. Can I tell you something? We need to find people and pour into them. That I sound like a broken record. Every time I'm up here, we need to find people to pour into. Why? Because we don't know who God's going to use that we pour into. God uses broken people to reach other people. It's a theme throughout the Bible. Uh, Mark chapter 5 is one of my favorite chapters. There's a lot going on there. But one of my favorite areas is the maniac of Gadara, Gadara. This was a man that was so broken, nobody could do anything with. Nobody could do anything with. But then God came on the scene. Jesus came on the scene, healed him. He's not broken anymore with the demons. And what does he say in Mark chapter 5, verses 19 through 20? It says this. It says right here. Howbeit Jesus suffer him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, for thee, and has compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish, that means proclaim, into Decapolis how great things Jesus has done for him, and all the men did marvel. Hey, this is a broken man that had no future. This is a broken man that nobody could do anything with. This is a broken man that couldn't think past probably tomorrow. Yet, when God got done with it, not only could he use them, but he sent them out and people marveled. God uses the broken. We look back at, at the scriptures that we have here, and I'm looking back at what, what I had written down, and I'm scattered brain all over, so give me a second. But I have this. I have this. I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Hey, that burden comes. He's screaming, I have five brothers. He doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be there. The burden's there. Who's your burden for? Who's your burden for? Can I tell you something? We get in seasons where we drop the ball. Pastor, can I say that there's probably been seasons where you drop the ball where there just isn't that burning for one soul that's in your mind. Can I tell you something? I've had seasons where I'm on fire wanting to knock doors and visit people, but I've also had seasons where I back off on sharing the gospel. Can I tell you what happens? I don't, I'm not visible. I'm not looking out at who's there. Can I tell you something else? I'm not making a list of who's around me that needs to hear the gospel. I, I, I really believe that this man that is broken, the rich man, if he would have known the Lord and known the ramifications, he would have traded that whole fortune for five minutes to warn his family. He would have done anything to warn his family. So here's my question for you. This is, this is 
on my heart. Who needs to hear the gospel? Is it your aunt? Is it a coworker? Write their names down. Is it a mom? Is it a dad? You guys know who it is. Who are you working with? Who needs to hear the gospel? Who's the one breath away from going into a sinner's hell? That's their name. Write it down. Start praying for them. Is it your neighbor? Can I tell you something? If you don't have somebody written down on, down on a piece of paper and you aren't praying for them, who else? Who is? You're their life preserver going over the cliff to a sinner's hell. Note cards are there. I'm going to end with this. I, have, I love this church. I love this pastor. This is not a fun say goodbye time because I really do care for you guys. I got so much out of this church and from you people. But I, there's, a, there's so many towns within 10 minutes of Richland Center that don't have a gospel church, that don't have anybody out there preaching the gospel. And I always wonder, if we didn't move to Richland Center, Wisconsin, we would have moved to Muscat Day, 20 minutes away, no, no Bible-believing church, would I be saved today? Somebody needs to reach Muscaday. Somebody needs to reach the people in Richland Center. Somebody has to reach my sisters, has to reach Joe Chadwick, and needs to reach Kyle Bindle. I'm going back because somebody needs to care for these people. I'm encouraging you. I'm encouraging you guys right now. If you don't have somebody on your heart, pray to God that he breaks your heart tonight for somebody and start praying for them. Make them who you have a burden for. With that, I'm going to let Pastor finish it.